Yeah. Hey everybody, in this video, I wanna show you all the techniques that went into making the faux wood texture out of paper mache and pipe insulation foam that went into this year's award-winning Halloween costume. For this tutorial, I'm gonna be demonstrating by making this new custom head uh, fit for a four stilt costume. Um, this took me about six hours of active work over the course of around three days uh, to allow for the paint to dry overnight. Whether you're here to learn how to make faux wood texture or to make a custom head for your own four stilt costume, or both, there should hopefully be a little bit of something here for everybody. So let's get started. The first thing you'll want to consider are the dimensions of your mask. How big it'll have to be to fit proportionately with the rest of your costume. I started by cutting out a curved sided trapezoid which bent in thirds thanks to the way the cardboard naturally folded. I completely eyeballed this step using my finished costume body as a reference, so these dimensions may not work for everybody, but the shape more or less looks like this. Once I was happy with the shape, I started sewing down a bunch of pipe insulation foam directly to the cardboard using yarn and a blunt yarn needle. This step is the most important in the process, as the orientation of the foam tubing will define all the features of the mask, including eye sockets, horns, and in this case, tusks. I wanted mine to be more or less symmetrical with room for two eyes on each side, but you could get pretty wild with it depending on where you place your tubing. Okay, that's recording. Cool. Uh, okay, so the thing that I need to do now is reinforce the main horns on the top. Those are going to be super floppy, so I need to make them with a lot of layers. Um, and at the same time, I can reinforce like the eyebrows, basically. That. So at this point you should have something that looks like this, which is a little bit too big for my camera, but if you want to think about doing eyes at this point, basically anywhere that you have foam overlapping is a good place to put an eyeball. All of those are really, really good eye sockets. So if you want to have symmetrical eyes, you can do symmetrical eyes. If you want to have eyes all over the place, basically any single one of these holes is a good place to put an eyeball. Now if this is a mask that you want to wear over your face, now is the time to cut out eye holes for yourself and you're just gonna have to be the judge of that. But if you're making this for a four stilt costume, you're actually gonna be wearing a helmet on the inside of this thing. So this is gonna be sitting on top of your head so you can look straight down at your feet while you're walking around and you won't have to crane your neck up the whole time just to see where you're going. After attaching all the pipe foam to the cardboard, it's critical to reinforce the horns with wire to keep them rigid. If left without a wire backbone, long foam extremities will lose structural integrity due to gravity. I had some problems with the antlers and hips of my costume becoming floppy over time, so I won't be making that mistake again. Here I'm actually using TIG welding rods for this step, although I don't necessarily recommend going out and buying those for this purpose because there are way cheaper alternatives that work just as effectively. I just happen to have some extra ones on hand. Afterwards, I moved on to wrapping the whole thing in 2-inch cloth medical tape to create a consistent base layer by bridging the gaps between all the foam and open areas of cardboard. Besides holding everything together, the tape also provides a porous layer that the paper mache can more effectively adhere to than the bare foam. Other kinds of tape may also work, but I haven't really experimented with alternatives. If you're going for a tree look, this is also the part where you're going to want to start shaping your branches. 
For this, I grouped together some foam extremities or cut some of them in half and then wrapped them in such a way to create the appearance of twigs and branching points from the horns. I did a little bit of taping off camera, but at this point you should have something pretty three-dimensional, covered completely in tape so that you have a really good foundation to do all your paper mache work on. Um, the hardest part is going to be wrapping all of the antlers, all the horns and stuff, just because there's a lot more surface area um, all around. Um, the easiest part's gonna be all these big flat areas because you can just slap on a paper towel and there'll be no issue. So I'll walk you through those steps now. My process for paper mache here is pretty simple because I'm skipping all the traditional steps and just using paint and paper towels. Typically with paper mache you'd want to start with a glue layer, then prime it, and then wash with your darkest foundational color, but for the sake of time and materials I'm lumping all those steps into one and simply sticking my paper towels down with black house paint. I did my entire costume using this shortcut method and haven't had any problems with peeling, so you're welcome to approach this whichever way you want. You'll see I start by painting the surface with paint, sticking a scrunched up paper towel over it for texture, and then covering it with another layer of paint so the paper dries rigid, and fully colored, so I won't have to go back and paint over it all again later. So the trick to doing the horns, like the rest of it, is to try to put as much paint down as you can in the area you're going to be working with. Getting your piece of paper towel here. I would recommend actually ripping them in half, long ways, so you end up with really long strips like this, and wrapping them where you can see it. And you're going to have to go back around and do the back sides a little bit later. Might even be easier once it dries. Uh, to go back and fill in the spots on the back side. Because then you can manipulate it without getting paint on absolutely everything. So that's an example of a branch. Um, you definitely go through a lot more paint, and I cannot emphasize this enough. You want to have cardboard down or something you're willing to get paint on because it drips. Well, I've just run out of black paint, so we're going to have to use a backup and hopefully be able to finish the rest of this, because uh, I don't particularly want to go to the hardware store. <laughs> I think that pretty much is all the black paint I have. <laughs> uh, it's not perfect, there are a lot of spots that I'm going to have to touch up, but it'll be a lot easier to do so after it's totally dry because the glare from the sun um, kind of obscures a lot of the white spots left in the paper towels. So I'm going to let this thing dry and then I'm going to come back, touch up all the spots, and start going over all of it with the brown paint. All right. Now that your black layer has completely dried, you can start moving on to painting it in the increasingly lighter shades of brown. For this example, I have these four colors. I'm reaching the ends of my tubes because these are kind of left over from the bigger project. 
but I'm going to do the best I can with what I have. So for the first one, I'm using burnt umber, and I'm just going to try to wash the whole thing with this layer of brown. Um, the point of doing this in black first is so that all the nooks and crannies are your darkest shade, which will add depth against the progressively lighter shades of brown as you get to the surface parts of the texture on the paper towels. Alright, so after you finished your burnt umber layer, I'm moving on to raw umber, which is a slightly lighter shade of brown. Almost looks kind of darker, but it, it offers some variation, at least. <laughs> and I am genuinely almost out of this, so we might not use as much of this as I would like. After that, I'm going to move on to uh, a different shade of burnt umber. This almost looks more orange to the first one that I used. The, the whole point is to add as much brown variation as you can. Alright, and then the last one that I have is this really light shade. It's almost bronze. It's called Raw Sienna. I would recommend actually being selective about where you put this on the piece, uh, just so that it adds a bit of a highlight, just selectively. And you really just want to brush this on the most superficial bumps created in the paper mache. You don't really want this to go very deep or it's going to ruin that illusion of depth brought on by the darker colors underneath. So you got to be really careful about how you apply this one, super lightly. After I finished painting this with all the brown, I did quite a lot of the decorating off camera, but I'll give you some of the highlights. Uh, first of all, I went ahead and hot glued on genuine moss all over it, basically in all the nooks and crannies where you might find moss on a tree. Um, I do recommend doing studies with pictures of moss on trees so you know kind of how you would most expect it to appear. After that, inside of the eyes, what I did here is I took those uh, styrofoam balls that you would usually use for like a, a solar system project, you can find them at a craft store, cut them in half. Then I used this kind of shiny paper that I shoved in those spots as well so that it will kind of reflect when the light hits it. All the leaves are left over from the Halloween costume, but essentially what they are here, if you can see it, are these leaves hot glued onto triplets of florist wire wrapped with florist tape. And then all this grass here are actually grass skirts from the dollar store that I dyed green in 2019 for a previous costume. Uh, and then I guess one of the most important things, and I touched on this a bit earlier in the video, is the helmet on the inside here. So like I had said earlier, since this is gonna be worn for a four stilt costume, you're actually gonna be wearing it on top of your head, not in front of your face. That way you can look down at your feet and you know where you're walking and you don't have to crane your neck up the whole time just to see where you're going. And I attached this to the inside of the mask using zip ties, which have been my best friend for all of these crafts. 
Um, although I'm almost positive that there's a more secure way to do this because uh, it does move around a bit and you definitely want it to be a little bit more secure on your head. But for, for the meantime, this is functional. Okay, so this is what it looks like on my head when I'm looking straight ahead. But since I'm gonna be on four stilts, I'm actually gonna be leaning over like this. So I'm looking straight down at the ground, but the mask is looking straight ahead, which creates this illusion that's really helpful uh, so that you're not messing your neck up when you're walking around in that. So that's what that looks like. If you have any questions about techniques that go into this mask or four stilt costumes uh, or art questions in general, feel free to leave a comment and I might make it into another tutorial video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Some, some glitches, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs>